I am continuing my reading. What I'm doing in this series is to read through the entire standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This consists of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine of Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. I am reading in a chronological order of events, not according to publication or volume, so I will be skipping around just a little bit as I move along. Right now, I am still in Deuteronomy, though I am getting near the end. I am a little over halfway through. This will be chapter 25. So, let us see what we got here. Judges prescribe punishment for wicked. Marriage law provides for brother's widow. Just weights and measures required. Israel commanded to blot out Amalekites from under heaven. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here apparently, so let's see what we can do in one video. If there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face, according to his fault, by a, by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him, and not, and not exceed, lest, if he should exceed, and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. So, I like to go, you know, you justify the righteous, condemn the wicked, that's what. But the punishment has to be carried out in the eyes of the judge. The judge doesn't pass judgment and then you take him over somewhere else and inflict the punishment. No, the judge has to be present. And I like the 40, you can beat him with 40 stripes, but no more. Because if you do more, then both, I think this is both indicating a uh, preventing permanent scarring permanent disfigurement but also to do more is to in a sense treat them as if they're an animal dehumanize them so can't do that we don't dehumanize people anyways let us see verse 4 thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn if brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother, which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face, and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, The house of him who him that hath his shoe loosed. Now this sounds like a very odd law. Now I want you guys to go back. Verse 4, Don't muzzle the ox when he treadeth the corn. That says, If you muzzle the ox, that is to prevent him from eating the corn that falls out, you know, the, the leftovers. And this is, again, just a law of don't be greedy. Take care of your animals and let them eat a little bit while, you're, while they're working. You know, that's, that's what this law is. Like, there's a lot of laws like this in the law of Moses. But this particular law here of the brothers, uh, a, brother, a husband's brother, this is what is usually referred to as a Leverite marriage. And we see an example of this in the story of Judah in Genesis. When Judah's eldest son dies and his second son marries his wife. Now that whole story is all a bit, um, yeah, so we're not going to get back into that. But that is the perfect example of a Leverite marriage following this law. And what this is, is th th this goes back to the eternal marriage and the ceilings and the families. When the brother marries the wife, this is not an eternal marriage. This is not a ceiling 
for time and eternity. This is a uh, temporal marriage, and the first son born in that temporal marriage is then sealed to the brother that died so that he has a mortal posterity to carry on his line. So that his line does not die out. Because that is actually, that is very important, in even in the gospel. To have a mortal posterity, not just an eternal posterity, but a mortal posterity. That is something that is very much emphasized in the scriptures. There's even, uh, Brigham Young said that the reason that Cain was cursed was not just because he killed Abel, but because he killed Abel before Abel could have mortal posterity. He took that blessing away from Abel. And that is what cursed Cain. Now, whether you believe that or not, I don't care. It's just an idea that Brigham, that, that Brigham Young put out there. So... The idea is that you provide for your brother. All right. The wife is still going to carry the child. She's going to have that maternal bond that comes with pregnancy. The idea that you are not willing to provide your brother with a mortal posterity, mortal descendants, even though they're not literally, we're not talking about genetics. We're talking about his name. A record of his name being preserved throughout the generations. That is what is important. And when you are refusing to do this, you are basically saying you want your brother to be forgotten. Or that you don't care. You don't care if your brother is remembered. That's the problem here. It may seem, it seems very odd, does I, It's a very odd law. But that's what the purpose is. The purpose is to maintain the family name. To keep that person's name in remembrance throughout the generations. Remember, the lost tribes are lost not because we don't know where they are, but because they don't know who they are. Preserving the names is vital. And so if a man is not willing to preserve the name of his brother, that is a shame to him. And that is why his shoe is loosed, she spits in his face, she is saying, this guy is not doing what he should be doing. Now he can't be forced to, the law doesn't require him to. He can, he can say, no, I'm just not going to do it. But if he does, he carries that mark of shame. Now I've... Uh, kind of rambled a bit, so let's get along here. Verse 11. When men strive together one with another, and the wife of the one draweth near for to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smiteth him, and putteth forth her hand, and taketh him by the secrets, then thou shalt cut off her hand, thine eye shall not pity her. Now, the secrets, I think we all know what that's a euphemism for, so... I'm not exactly sure. This seems like a very odd law. It's, a, it's an understandable law to some extent. saying, even if you're fighting, you're not supposed to be touching other men in that way, whether there is a fight going on or not. But uh, it just seems a little odd that it's here. I, but I do love that the secrets is just a great euphemism. euphemism. <laughs> Anyways... 13. Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when, they, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even, that, even all that were feeble uh, behind thee. 
when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of, Am of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forgive it. Okay, there's two things here that I want to talk about. That last one, Amalek went to war with them, tried to destroy Israel. And so God said, look, at the land of Amalek was not part of the Canaanites. was not part of Canaan. It's not one of the seven Canaanite nations. And so it's not part of the covenant land that God gave to Abraham. But because of the way Amalek treated Israel, God is saying, go in there and wipe them out. It says, blot out the remembrance of them. Again, this goes back again to that law of the brother and his, of the, of the husband's brother. In the one case, we are to preserve the family, to preserve the name of the brother. But in the case of, the, of Amalek, God has decreed that they are to be wiped out, that no remembrance of them be found. But that other one, the weights and measures, this is one that you had, back then, everything was done by weight or length. You had weights and measures, weight and length. This is what it was, or you know, volume. So a, a parcel of land would be valued in a weight of gold. A talent was a certain weight of gold. A shekel was a certain weight of gold. So if you were going to sell something for 100 shekels, you would get out a scale, and on one side you would put a block that weighed equal to 100 shekels, and then whoever was paying you 100 shekels, they would put gold or silver on the other side of the scale until it balanced out, and then you would have, in weight, 100 shekels. You'd have similar things for length, you know, if you're gonna sell five cubits, you would have a measuring stick that is one cubit long, and you would measure one, two, three, four, five. Volume is the same thing. You're going to sell, I think a hen was a certain measure of volume, while well, you'd have a jar that is equal to one hen so these measures were all there. That's how you that's how you sold, that's how you traded. Unjust measures are having two weights meant that if I was going to sell something and charge you 100 shekels, I'd have one weight that weighed 101 shekels. Put it on there. And then you'd have to put 101 shekels on. Therefore, I even though I told you I was only charging you 100, you'd actually be paying me 101. On the other hand, if I was to buy something, then I would get a weight that weighed only 99 shekels and use that one. And that way I'd have these two weights, one for buying and one for selling, so that when I sold something, I could get a little extra, and when I bought something, I would pay a little less. And it's the same thing with measures. You have a yardstick that's supposed to be a cubit, but you measure it just a half an inch less. Well, now that builds up over time. You get a little bit less or a little bit more. That's what this is talking about. But you you don't do this. This is fraud. This is how fraud was committed in the ancient world. So God is saying here, no, one measure, one weight, and whatever it is, that's what you use. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we will leave that one here, and I will see you in the next one.